If you heard it, that means it's working. So if it's working, that means I can turn this thing back on and I can get done with this. You, you've got audio over there. It's going to the stream. There's enough of it on there. So you have it or you either you don't have it. Which one is it? You need to be able to let me know and tell me whether you got audio or not. Well, I straightened the kinks out in this microphone. Otherwise, I've got to stand here and look like I don't know what I'm doing. And that's what you're doing a good job of making me look like right now. So tell me you can hear it, yes or no? Yeah, it's good? <laughs> this thing doesn't work? Check test one, two. We're good.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am, will kindly ask everyone to please take a seat. Thank you. So welcome to Spring 2019 Flex Day. My name is Erin Craig and I'm the Flex Day coordinator here. Um, what I'm most excited about right now is that it's not raining. So we have a very busy schedule and I'm going to say a few words and we have a program this morning and then we'll break out into our sessions. Session one, have lunch and then a couple more sessions. So the theme of our Flex Day today is crafting student-centered success. So as we sit here independently, before you do many collaborative learning experiences after this morning's session, I'd like you to think to yourself, of how do you measure success here at Golden West? Is it enrollment, coursework, transfer course completion, persistence, CTE skills, careers, life, and definitely many more things that are on the forefront of our brain. So when we decided that this was going to be the theme, we really wanted to think about how we as an ecosystem here at Golden West, all of the components be working together with the students at the core. So hopefully today you experience new sessions, you meet new people, and you learn something new about student success. And my favorite way to think always as an educator is to reverse engineer everything, to begin with the end in mind, so as we work through today, we'd really like you to think about that your most important work is always ahead of you. It's never behind you, and that's from Dr. Covey. And now I'd like to introduce our president, President McGrath. Good morning. My job is to kind of frame the day. And so what I wanted to do is to start from a different perspective. And that perspective is where we are, not only as a college, but as a region. Take a look at the funding model, and then take a look at some opportunities that I think we have that are really unique and really are going to change the focus and the direction of the college. One of the things that shocked me when I first came, and, and my wife and I lived in San Diego for 10 years, and we thought the housing prices were high in San Diego. When we arrived in Orange County, um, there was a little sticker shock for us. New homes in Orange County right now, the median is over a million dollars. Now, Huntington Beach must be a lower income area because it's only 800,000. Westminster, 600. Garden Grove, 500. Um, Santa Ana 500 and Stanton I, looks like is the most affordable, almost 500. The other thing that really impacted me was the rental rates. In Huntington Beach, an 877 square foot apartment goes for $2,100. Last year at this time, it went for 2,000. That's a 7% increase. When I look at our students and how are they going to afford an apartment in this area, they must be having six or seven students per room to afford these types of, of costs. The other thing you can see at the, uh, the very bottom and those in the back that can't, so I'll let you know, apartments from 1,000 to 1,500, let's say there were 100 apartments in Huntington Beach, 2% of those would be between the 1,000 and $1,500 rate. From 1,500 to 2,000, 45% of those are within that rate, and those over 2,000 are 53%. So the majority of the apartments in this area are above $2,000 a month. So when we think about the students that are coming here, we almost want to say, how in the world did you find us, given the economics of, of the world that we're in? The next thing that has changed, and I'm starting with uh, we're going to work our way up. So if we start from the bottom and work our way up, then I think at the end we're going to see the opportunities. Our world as a college system in, in California has changed dramatically. 
what has happened was, and most of the colleges in the state are down in enrollment. When the economy is good, students work rather than going to school, and that's certainly true here at Golden West. But I want to see the middle part. That's the part that has changed. The difference in our FTS is 1,100 between where we were last year and where we are now. The budget, before the budget model, we would have earned or would have taken about $6 million to make up the difference. With the new budget model and the change in the FTS rate at 3,300, that means there is a difference of about $3 million between where we were and what it would take to make up the difference. Does that make sense to everyone? I'll do it again. What it would have taken before at the funding model now takes us an additional 740 FTS. So it's not that we're down 1,100, which is a huge amount to swallow, but at the new funding model, we are down 1,900 FTS. That's about 20% of where we are as a college. Now let's take a look at the, um, what it means as a college. The funding formula before at uh, 5,400 was 48 million. The funding model at 3,700 is 33 million. And so the difference is $15 million in what we are being funded now compared to what we were funded last year just based on FTS. Now the opportunity comes. What has changed with the new funding model is that it's based on success as well. So we have an opportunity to not only make up the difference between what we were funded last year and the new funding model, but we potentially can make more per FTS. And that is the part that I think this room and the opportunity that we have today can absolutely knock it out of the park. The opportunities, and we'll go through this slide, for success measures with the quality of students, with the magic that happens in our classroom, the funding formula will change in our favor in a dramatic fashion, and that's why today is so important. So let's start at the top, and I know in the back you probably can't see these, so either get binoculars or, um, or uh, I'll, I'll read it out to you. The associate degree, every associate degree that we issue we get an additional $1,300. So that takes us now up to about 47, 4,800. For every promised student, we get another $3,300, excuse me, $333. And every student that had a Pell Grant that graduated, we get another 500. That means that for every associate degree that we issue, where students had a Promise Grant as well as a Pell Grant, we got an additional 2153. If we go back and you see the 3727 and you add the 2100 onto that, guess what? For that particular student, we just made more from a funding perspective than we did the previous year. The other measures are we don't have baccalaureate degrees. There's only 15 colleges, but they're the same as associate degrees. The ADT degrees, which we, I believe, um, Albert, do we have 22 or 23 ADT degrees? 23. For every ADT degree, we get 1,700, 444 for Promise, 666 for Pell. So look, every ADT degree, we get an additional 2,800. That changes dramatically the work that we are doing on this campus. And when you look at the difference in the FTS rate, we just made it up with the funding formula to our advantage. So rather than looking at what we don't have, here's an opportunity to say, this is what we do have, and we can make a dramatic difference for our students as well as for the college. Um, I can send this out, and um, you can go through all of these, but those two are the biggest ones, as well as the certificates. That is another one. And so the CTE programs that offer certificates that has a huge difference in the bottom line. Now, Golden West has amazing students. And the success rates that we have, graduation, transfer, are some of the highest in the state. And for that, I am looking at you and saying thank you.
there is only one place those success rates come from, and that's from our classroom. And for the work that you do, here it is, and there are colleges up and down the state that would die to have these success rates, and so thank you very much. The other group that's done an amazing job is student services. They have supported the work that's gone on in the classroom. They have gone above and beyond, and for their work and your work, we have formed a unique partnership that has had a difference for our students. Now, as we look at today, why is today so important? Well, if we work backwards, as Aaron said, the end in mind is student success. And if you look at the middle of this kind of oblong surfboard, it's the faculty. What you do each day in the classroom determines student success. Now, it just isn't, I'm gonna roll out a lesson plan and I'm gonna follow the syllabus. What goes above and beyond is having students know that you care for them, that you're interested in them, that you anticipate the rough spots in the, in the 16 weeks that you're with them, and you've anticipated those and prepared students to get through those rough spots before they've ever gotten there. It's partnering with tutoring and making sure that the tutoring center knows what you need your students to, to do to be successful, and so the tutors are prepared and ready to do your work for you in the tutoring center. It's making sure that the campus is welcoming, and that's our job. Make sure it's clean, that when students come, they're excited and they want to be here. And finally, that what happens in the English department mirrors what happens in the math department, that mirrors in the social and behavioral science, that mirrors in the CTE, that our programs interchange with one another. So when students are here, it isn't a unique experience, it's the same experience in that we are helping them succeed regardless of their major, regardless of their class, and most importantly, regardless of what they're going to do when they're done with school. After that, the department supports us. The program supports it is developed by the department. And finally, it's the role of the institution to bring all those things together. The other thing that's important is that we realize that student success is driven for students by a lot of other things than the classroom. Not only enrollment and budget, but what community they came from. The equity issues, the barriers that our students face before they get here is something that they bring with them. And it's our job to anticipate those, work through those with them, and help them be successful. Also, what high school they came from. Some high schools uh, probably better prepare if you look at the numbers, but it's our job to accept every student that walks in the door and anticipate what they need regardless of what high school they came from. But by asking and being a part of, as Matt is doing in dual enrollment program, we are partnering with high schools to make it a seamless transition. But that comes from the work uh, that you're doing um, with our high school partners. Finally, funding, and we have an opportunity with the new funding model to absolutely garner additional resources that other colleges don't. And finally, the economy. As you probably all know, when the economy's good, students don't come to school, they work. And when the economy's bad, they come back to school to get additional resources, education to improve their lot in the workplace. There are some possible solutions that we can do. And the first one is, each of you got a bag when you came in? Other than kisses in it, which are nice. What's important is the, the uh, tags that came with it. One of the ways that we can improve our funding is through financial aid, through Pell Grants, through um, um, FAFSA applications. And so inviting financial aid to come into your classroom to explain the financial aid system to help students get the, the resources that they could use and that they need to be successful is a huge game changer. Not only for student success, which is, the, that's why we're here, but also from a funding perspective. Student services, I don't know if you know this or not, I think they've made, if we have 11,000 students here on the campus, they've made 12,000 phone calls. They have called individual students, asked them 
Why aren't you here? Have you completed the registration process? Have you got your books? Have you, we are, our student service center has been the Walmart greeters of this campus and they have dramatically changed the number of students that are attending our campus and so all of us owe student services a thank you uh, very much, so thank you. The other thing that we have done is payment arrangements for students that could make their payments before we drop them. Now as we're talking to them, we're finding out where are you, what economic issues are you facing. So we're setting up payment plans for students to make sure that they can still continue their education. And this way, they aren't out and waiting a semester or a year to come back. So we're creatively working through ways to keep our students here. We want to create a first year experience. When students come, we want them to be in cohorts, that they get to know one another, they um, feel like this is their home. One of the issues when I, um, I graduated from Big Bear High School and the um, population of Big Bear is about 15,000 people and I went to Santa Monica College and the population at Santa Monica College was 35,000 students. Santa Monica College was twice what my hometown was and I was intimidated, overwhelmed, and I couldn't believe how so many students could go in one place. And the only thing that helped me was basketball. I had 12, 15 friends, I had my cohort, they knew me, I knew them. If I wasn't there and I was missed, then they would reach out and find out what's going on. On a campus our size, if a student comes and doesn't know anyone, they run into a rough spot, they leave. And so our challenge is how can we create a first year experience where people are known. If you're not here, you're missed and people know you by name. Um, the math and English departments, especially with the change in the new legislation, are working hard. They're coming up with creative ways to help our success and that's one of the funding measures as well. Students who get through transfer level math and English in one year and so our math and English faculty have done an amazing job. In some ways, we're ahead of other people in the state because of the creativity and the uniqueness of the faculty that we have. But we have challenges that they're working on, and I put our money on us, that in a year or so, those are going to be amazing numbers. Athletic orientations, we have, Albert, three, 400 athletes. That's where our... Uh, a large percentage of our equity students are doing orientations, helping them not only play their sport, but be successful on our campus is something that helps all of us. I don't know if you know this or not, but every athlete is one FTS. They have to take a full load to be eligible. They are the only group on campus that has to take a full load. And so those students make a huge difference for the success rates, our transfer rates, as well as our funding. The FAFSA scholarships, that comes with the financial aid, inviting them to come in. And for us as a, as a institution, and I, when I taught business law, I needed every second of every hour that I had to make sure the students got through um, the, uh, the course of, um, outline that I had. But it didn't take me long to realize that I could do all kinds of magic, but if I started with 35 students and ended with 20 or 25 because of economic issues for the students, then I hadn't done my job. So having them, students, have an opportunity to have access to financial aid, to have access to student services, to have access to the success measures that we have on the campus, changes the entire outlook for the campus. So having five or 10 minutes of your 16 weeks can change the success rates for thousands and thousands of students. And that's why this is so important and have you consider reaching out to uh, the financial aid office, it will make a difference for our students. Uh, I mentioned financial aid visits. And finally, the bottom one, again in the back you probably can't see this, but it's non-credit and dual enrollment. And so uh, I'm sure you have heard about non-credit, but let's talk about it for a minute. If you look at the demographics of the high schools in our region, guess what? 
In the last five years, what are the number enrollments done? They've gone down dramatically. And if you fast forward another five years, <clears throat> it's going to change the number of students that we have, the opportunities that we have, and really the status of the college. So we have, and I'm putting again our money on this group, we have some opportunities that other colleges wish they had. One is to increase our non-credit program. And the idea of non-credit is that you have individuals that did not go to college, probably did not even go to high school, um, and, and their uh, ability is probably at the seventh or eighth grade level. So the idea is that we bring to them ESL for language, some of them want citizenship, GED, so they get their high school diploma. But the idea is that then we have a new feeder high school. Those students then become loyal to us. And as the demographics change, guess what? We have created a new demographic for future students to come. Now, I also know with non-credit, the ESL department has been working on non-credit for a number of years. And so we need to partner and work with them and make sure that it's a seamless between the non-credit and the credit. Math and English have opportunities to do non-credit as well, but this is a place that we certainly can grow um, the future for our students. Dual enrollment is where we offer college classes on high school campuses. We receive the FTS for that. We also pick up potential students that otherwise wouldn't be aware of the magic that happens here. And so with that, we now can recruit students from, from high schools in our feeder areas that were wondering should they, or after they have success with us, they say, yes, we should, and that's another way that we can increase our enrollment. Oops. Another work for you today. You are the experts for student success and the challenges and growth that, that they face. And I don't take that lightly at all. Everyone else on this campus, our job is to support you and make sure that when you walk into the classroom, you're ready to help our students, are be successful. And so what you do today by interacting with one another, creatively pushing, pulling, challenging one another, how can we help our students succeed? I can't think of a better day spent by this college than to have this agenda. We are going to share with you research and best practices. Um, Erin has done a great job, her committee, and so the breakout sessions are set up to expose you to different pedagogy, pedagogical approaches, as well as opportunities to try new things. And for that, I think as educators, we should always be willing to try a new thing to help students succeed. Open and honest, relevant uh, student-centered dialogue, ongoing collaboration and professional learning, continual improvement, and finally, to listen, learn, and grow. Um, we ask our students to do that. Today, the college is asking you to do that. I applaud you for being here. Um, I commend the people that put it together. But most importantly of all, our students thank you, because what happens today will make a huge difference for them. Thank you. Thank you, President McGrath. So we all know next week we have an extremely important event that's happening, only happens once in a while. So we thought we would take this time to really make sure that we share some important information and who better to do that than our wonderful Dr. K. Nguyen. Good morning. Were you all ready to cram for finals? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, thank you so much for the opportunities. You know, we're really here to um, give you more information about the next week for accreditation. I've been getting a lot of phone calls from people like, how do I prepare for this? How do I prepare for this? Relax, we got you. We're gonna give you all the accreditation basics that you need to know uh, to be prepared for next week. So a couple key information. 
Okay, ACCJC, that's the R accrediting uh, body, and they stands for the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges. They've really been focusing on becoming more of a kinder, gentler commission. So what that means is that what they're really looking for are ways that our works and our processes are aligning to the accreditation standards. So they want to know, do we have the policy and procedures in place? And where are some of the evidence that we're following those policies and procedures? And so that's much more easier and it's something that we can all speak to. Um, more importantly, accreditation allows our students to receive um, federal financial aid. And it really gives us time to reflect and engage in continuous evaluation quality improvement. So again, the visit is not to kind of look under every rocks and see where we've gone wrong, but really looking to confirm what we've written in our accreditation report. Um, how do we say what we do and are we doing what we said we would do, right? Um, I think more importantly, the, a good accreditation visit means that Kay gets to keep her job. So <laughs> keep that in mind for next week. Anyway, so for next week, here's a couple of things. So Monday through Thursday, the peer review team will be on campus. They'll be in our classrooms and in our committee meetings. So we know for next week we have the Academic Senate, we have Planning and Budget, and Recruitment for Completion. So don't be alarmed. You'll see a couple of people just peeking in to see how some of our governance processes work. Okay, They'll, um, and each team member is responsible for verifying a specific standard. So with that said, there may be some things that we've written, um, and it's in you know, GWC lingo and speak, so they may not understand those processes well. And what they'll be doing is they'll be meeting with different individuals, administrators, faculty, staff, class, and then just ask questions, um, just more clarifying questions, okay? Um, they'll re they've already reviewed all of our documents and our data, and they'll attend some of our classes and observe. I know this sounds a little scary for faculty, right? Because especially now with all the things that have been going on. So I'm gonna give you a little tip. These are the individuals who'll be visiting, maybe visiting your classroom. Now, these are really great looking photos and they're really nice individuals. So some of them will be in your class. Typically they'll be there at the beginning um, just to kind of see you know, if the class is starting um, on time, if students are there and then they'll observe for five, 10 minutes and then they leave. So there's really nothing to worry about. They will not disrupt um, any types of instruction. They won't be asking your uh, students uh, when they're in class and really they're not there to look at um, your teaching. They're just there to kind of observe, you know, that instruction is taking place and then they move on. So this is how we're going to prepare. It is not a final exam. We've written everything about Golden West College and all of the different ways that we're meeting our college mission. And that's in our accreditation report. So think of it as portfolio week, really. This is where we're going to showcase all of the amazing work that you've been working to make sure that our college is meeting its mission. And more importantly, remember why we are here not just today, because it's flax, but why are we here and you know, come to campus every day? We're here for student success. I know um, President McGrath has been talking about that, but we're working to get students to be college ready, right? So all of the great work in ESL, math, English, college success, and even with all of our faculty encouraging students to take use of all the resources available for them. We're here for student success. We help support students earn their degrees and certificates, um, we help them transfer to four-year institutions, and we put them on the right path, career path that is financially secure for them and their families. So, and it's more importantly is that as we say all of these are the things that we've done, we actually have a lot of data to back it up, yeah? Our key performance indicators show that we've conferred over 2,500 degrees and certificates um, last year. That's amazing. We've transferred over 900 students to the UCs and the CSUs. Again, that's amazing work that we couldn't do without you guys. Um, our CT completion rate far exceeds the statewide average completion rate. So this is all the great work that's done in the CT areas as well as the work with the counselors. And we accomplish a lot of these things through the processes that we already have. We have our committees work, we have program review, outcomes assessment. These are not brand new terms for anybody in this room. We've all been engaging in these work. So when they ask you, how are we helping our students? You already have the answer, so no need to worry and cram. So I'm gonna briefly talk about the institutional self-evaluation report. Um, it has four standards and a lot of subsections. 
In total, we tried to cut it down to 224 pages of really interesting read. Um, and there's also a quality focus essay. And this is how we describe the different goals that we're doing to help students become college ready, but also putting them on the right career path and then providing all the necessary support services to help them get there. Um, our, the commission and also the visiting team has already received all of our information. They're probably fiercely preparing for our site visit right now, primarily because they're um, procrastinators, but also because they are all people with real jobs like us. Um, they are administrators, they're faculty, college presidents. So they have their, you know, eight to 10 jobs that they have to do, really. But on top of that, they're spending additional time to get to know our campus better. Uh, and they're really trying to look at us with a very positive lens. So if you want to know more information, go to goldenwestcollege.edu slash accreditation. If you guys are motivated and want to read the entire report, okay? But if you don't want to, I'm going to give you a quick overview, okay? So we talked about it. There are four primary standards. Standard one focuses on our mission, academic quality, and institutional effectiveness and integrity. Standard two focuses on the instructional programs that we have, library learning support services, and also the student support services that we provide to students. Standard three focusing on the different types of resources that we have on campus, including personnel, um, technology, uh, facilities, and budget. And then also on leadership and governance. Okay, so here is the breakdown of what each standard means. So standard one, we need to demonstrate how we are meeting our mission statement, right? So I talked about it. We help to get students to be college ready. We help them to get degrees and certificates and then transfer. And it boils down to we graduate and transfer a lot of students. That's um, the work that we do. And then how do we know that we've accomplished our missions? We have our KPIs, but we also have tons of data and you help provide us with your outcomes assessment and your program review reports. These are different ways that we are determining that we're meeting the college mission. And we provide accurate and truthful information to the public about who we are as an institution. So our catalog, it's a beautiful masterpiece that showcases all of our instructional programs and all of the support services that we provide to students. And it gives them a little bit more information about our expectations as well. Standard two, student learning programs and support services. This is how we demonstrate that our institutional programs meet the extreme uh, quality and rigor that is appropriate to higher education, right? So again, I'm repeating myself. We use program review, we have outcome assessment, and we, through our curriculum development, we ensure that we're providing a high quality instructional program to all of our students. Um, we provide students with library and other learning support services to support their learning, you know, through the library, tutoring services, writing center, and supplemental instruction, tons of different ways that we're pro providing student support. Um, and then we also help them with necessary student support services to help them succeed, right? We've got counseling, student, the Student Services Center, um, student equity, all of the work that we're doing um, through recruitment and completion, um, our equity center, all of these are the work that we do because we know students um, are not just in the classroom, but all of the other services that we provide also impact their success. I talked about standard three, right? Um, this is where we demonstrate that we have the best workforce, and I'm looking at you guys right now. You guys are one of the best uh, faculty that I've, the best faculty I've worked with. Um, and then we have the staff and administrators here to ensure your success. Uh, we have safe and accessible facilities, and we make sure that our technology is reliable and accessible to all students. Um, finally, we manage our budget appropriately, and we have clean audits. So those are really crucial things that, um, you know, Janet and her team does to make sure that we're not being in trouble with um, the auditors. So finally, our leadership and governance. We have a very good governance process that ensures everyone has a voice in decision making. I've talked about this before. Um, a lot of times people don't realize that you are all part of the decision making process on campus, whether you are uh, participating in committees work, um, you know, you're making changes to your curriculum. Those are all core decision making that are designed to help students succeed and you have been a part of that. Our college president provides the leadership over institutional improvement. Um, the governing board here, I want to thank our two uh, board members, Dr. Prinsky and um, 
uh, Huck, um, Mary Hornbuckle here today, they're here to support us. They're here to make sure that the college is fulfilling its mission. So I want to, on behalf of the college, thank you for coming. And with all of that work that we have, we're really here to delineate the responsibility and also the collaborations that occur across campus and also the district as well. So that's everything that's in a nutshell about the accreditation process. Um, really, you guys have been all doing the work already. We're just here to showcase to them how amazing we are as an institution. So I have a couple kind of questions for faculty if you really want to do some more homework or reflection. So just think about, you know, not just for this semester, but moving forward, what is your role within the institution and also the, within the governance structure of the college? We have so many different committees available that we'd love to get your feedback and perspectives on. The Institutional Effectiveness Committee, I hear is a really fabulous committee on campus. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then also, what is your level of participation with regards to outcome assessment, right? Particularly the C slows and the um, P slow, so course and also program level outcomes. How have you been engaging in those processes? And then what is your level of participation with curriculum development? Um, do you understand some of the requirements for distance education, like regular and substantive interaction and regular and effective contact with your students? And then how are you using program review for improvement? Um, the greatest part is program review is coming right after accreditation, so you can engage in that process immediately. Um, what is your understanding of how we prioritize faculty hiring um, positions and also evaluation processes of faculty? Um, what is your level of participation in college-wide decision-making process? So I talk about one of the biggest ways that faculty can be involved is through curriculum development. Okay? I've been talking a lot, but here's some of the key takeaway. Relax. Like I said, we have been doing a phenomenal job, and our report shows it. Um, but more importantly, make sure our guests feel welcome. They're going to be working literally 16 to 18 hours a day um, just to make sure that they get all the information necessary to write the best accreditation um, finding report for us. Um, they may be in your class, but it's only for a few minutes, so don't be alarmed. Um, if you really want to be a rock star, you can read Standard 2A. That has all of the information on the instructional programs. But more importantly, when they're here and they ask you questions, just remember why we are here. We are here to serve students and doing the best that we can to ensure their success. So with that said, thank you. Um, I want to give a shout out to all of the members who wrote the accreditation report, um, to my fabulous co-chair, Teresa Laverini. And if you are here and you are a part of that writing um, group, can you just stand up so that we can all give you a hand? Please. Thank you so much. Okay. So before I talk uh, nuts and bolts, I also want to show a little bit of gratitude um, first of all, to the presenters who submitted their presentations, worked tirelessly, met with me to ensure that there was a collaboration and tactile things in each presentation. So please join me in thanking the pres presenters for today. And lastly, this was definitely not an Aaron Craig effort. This was whole Flex Day Committee, who on a short timeline um, that I will take responsibility for myself, really pulled it together, worked collaboratively, analyzed, was very forward thinking. And in particular, I really wanna thank Christina Oja, who joined our team, stepped up, stepped in, and if it wasn't for her, we would not have tablecloths or food or anything like that. So please join me in thanking the committee and Christina in particular. Okay, does everyone have their program? So this flex day, we're doing a little bit, something a little bit different. So we're just finishing our morning session early, actually. So you'll have almost a 30 minute break to fill your coffee and use the restroom and schmooze before you arrive to your session on time. So we're gonna have three sessions. We're gonna go to session one, which starts at 
okay? Then we'll be back, and all the sessions are in the new criminal justice building, that way, with brand new classrooms and great technology and flexible learning spaces. So session one will all be over there. One of the sessions is downstairs in the MPR, and the rest of the sessions are up on the second floor, okay? And then we'll come back here for lunch, and then we'll return back to criminal justice, getting our exercise, working off our lunch for uh, session two and three. You can see that we built in breaks. We did that intentionally. So we don't want you to feel rushed, that if you're in a session at the end and you wanna ask questions or have dialogue, please feel free to do that. We wanna make sure that everyone has time to sort of debrief and reflect before we shift gears or before you start eating. Um, okay, so if you open the program, you'll see on the left, there are some suggested strands, and on the right are not only the sessions, on the top you'll see the session, the room number, the presenters, and a short description. And so each session will be repeated for each of the three sessions. I wanna make sure everyone's with me on that. So you have the flexibility and autonomy to go to any of the sessions that you want, create your own sort of appetizer, entree, dessert menu that meets your needs. On the left here, we included suggested strands, but I do not want you to feel like it is mandatory. Like if I wanna learn about new programs and policy, I must go to those three. That's not the case at all. We just wanted to give some insight, suggestions, or some ideas for those that were looking for it. And on the back, we have information about the night session. So if you, I mean, you're all here for the day, so you're not gonna be here for the night. But if you hear rumblings or questions of what's happening at night, the night session, everything is happening in the CJ building, nothing over here. Uh, okay, so a couple things. One, please sign in to each session. If you did not sign in in the front table, make sure that you do so before you go to your session. And each session has sign-in sheets for you to sign, because we do look at those, we calibrate, we track, all of those things. So be sure to do that. Um, based on uh, the Flex Day last spring and feedback that was given, there was a strong request uh, for an active shooter training on campus. And I really would like to thank Marty for following up and ensuring that that training can happen. And so that training is happening on Friday, March 1st from 9 a.m. to noon. And what I will do is at the end of the day today, there's a flyer and Marty might be sending it out to everyone, but on the SharePoint for Flex Day, that flyer will also be included with all of the presentations. So all of the documents from today, whether the PowerPoints, bless you, or uh, documents or graphic organizers or activities that you do, all of those will be at your disposal when you go onto SharePoint and you click on VP of Instruction, then you scroll down and click on Flex Day, okay? Um, have fun today. This is not serious. Have fun, make friends, learn, and that's it for me. I wanna thank you again for being so engaged and attentive. That's enough from me. We've got 30 minutes, so 30 minutes between now and the start of session one. Thank you.